That's Jim Mattis on the right, and this is Mike Saray. <laughs> Gentlemen, the floor and seats are yours. Hey, General, welcome back to San Francisco, the Marines Memorial Club, and uh, life hopefully uninterrupted west of the Mississippi, which is something new for you. Uh, when I talked to you a couple of weeks ago, you were looking forward to the book tour, but you said you thought it might turn into the Bataan Death March. Is that the case? <laughs> No, it's no problem. I'm, as long as I'm west of the Mississippi, I'm, I'm quite fine. <laughs> well, I think with all the, everything everybody's done to try to get you to break your silence, they probably should have learned one of your one lessons about air interrogation, and that is how well you can do with a pack of cigarettes and some beer. <laughs> but we don't need that tonight because this is going to be a break from the book tour. Uh, because we think the audience here tonight really wants to dig into this man's extraordinary career and connect the dots on the leadership lessons he's learned and how applicable they are to almost every walk and way of life. And so with that, I'd like to jump right in there and say that uh, you've always felt that the, probably the best manual, military manual, is a history book. Where did you, where did you learn that? Where was that imparted to you? Well, I think it was a combination of places. One was I was brought up in a house with no television, so what else are you going to do when it gets dark, you can't play baseball? Uh, but also, the Marine Corps uh, is not a kinder, gentler, kumbaya kind of outfit, you know? <laughs> and they had a reading list, and each time you got promoted, you know, you'd go in the, the locker room and look at the new rank and say, you feel pretty proud of yourself. And then uh, a young officer would come by and say, by the way, there's the new reading list for your rank. And the, the reading list is full of history. And as clearly as I can see you all there right now, numerous times I could put into a mental model how other people had dealt with some situation similar uh, and either successfully or unsuccessfully had done so. And so pretty soon you're living in the history and you realize, my gosh, this is a great, you know, in a dark path, this is a nice little flashlight to find your way forward. And, uh, and you, just, you just learn to apply it by the, by the actual application of the history in the battlefield. But that's interesting. That was a reading list not for senior officers or junior. The enlisted men had a reading list as well. And I looked over that list, and it was a, a wide variety of history books, pop culture books, and whatever, to get your Marines attuned to the mm -hmm. culture and the society they're living in. Well, what you're trying to do is get ownership down to the youngest sailors and Marines. You want them all to own that mission. And if you look around a room and you know what the Marine Corps reading list is for sergeants, for example, and you're talking to sergeants, you can give a mental model for what they're going to do based on something you know they've read. But as you create this sense of ownership going down, if you train them right, if you show them the historic an analogies to what, what you're, they're going to be going through, then if you clearly articulate what you need, you can sit back, take your hands off the steering wheel, and watch them surprise you with their initiative. Now, there's no benign neglect there. You've got to have feedback loops. I don't believe in command and control. I believe in command and feedback. That's what the Marine Corps teaches you. Because the two qualities we want in young sailors and Marines is initiative and aggressiveness. That's, that's what you reward. And so just sit back, give them the option to get going once you've prepared them. And if you clearly laid out what's going on and given a little bit of orientation, then they're going to they're gonna really uh, make you look good. Matter of fact, eventually you rise to high rank based on it. <laughs> but as a leader, you said, thanks to my reading, I've never been caught flat-footed by any situation or been at a loss of how a situation has been addressed successfully and unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. So is that the, 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 the guide star that you use as you do your strategy and planning? Uh, absolutely. For example, one night after 9-11, I was out in uh, Bahrain. I was, in the, I was called in by the fleet commander, uh, Navy vice admiral. I'm a one star. And he'd done his homework and he said, you know, the Army Special Forces and the CIA are going to beat them out of Mazari Sharif up north. They're falling back now. They're evacuating their families. They're going to fall back on Kabul. He'd done his homework and he said, no one's held Kabul in 500 years. He said, they're going to fall back on Kandahar, their spiritual home, and we could drop a bomb on a mosque or a hospital. We're going to start getting restrictions on us. He said, can you get the Marines from the Mediterranean fleet and the Pacific fleet together, move against Kandahar? I said, yeah, Admiral, I can do it. And he said, OK. He said, well, go do a reconnaissance. Here's you on any submarine airplane. 
perfect for 300 miles inland over the Hindu Kush. Uh, and uh, I went in, had wonderful cameras and, and telescopes on it. And as clearly as I can see you, as I circled, I again found how to make high rank, fight enemy generals dumber than a bucket of rocks. Um, and so we could see what to do. And, and frankly, uh, once we got the SEALs on the ground to watch the LZ, uh, it didn't matter how many troops they had or how close they cut their hair, uh, they were gonna lose. That's all there was to it because their generals were stupid. So the history books, though, allow you to look at this and, and you can just see the, the failure on the part of an enemy. Or if the enemy's got the drop on you, you can see how to recover on it because you've, you've been there before in history. General, when I first met you, it was in Egypt only a month after 9-11 <laughs> yeah. at a training exercise near Tobruk. And at that time, uh, I, did you know then that that Marine Expeditionary Brigade that you were forming up was going to Afghanistan, or were you scheming it up at that point? No, we were looking at it. Uh, in any Marine, when a fight happens, especially one like that, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody on active duty in the intelligence community, in the military, knew we'd let you down on 9-11. They never should have gotten through. Uh, we'd failed, and so it was personal now, because almost 3,000 people murdered on our soil, innocent, citizens of 91 countries had people die that day on 9-11. And we were going to go after them. We were going to teach them that they'd messed with the wrong country. So even while we were going through the exercise in Egypt, which was designed simply to show the people in the Arab lands were not backing out of this, you know, they, the bad guys might have thought they could hurt us and scare us, but we don't scare. But then about a dozen of us were shifted quietly over to fleet headquarters and that's when Admiral Willie Moore, uh, seeing what was happening and able to see that we could put the enemy on the horns of a dilemma, he actually conjured it up. We'd already identified places that we could go with the help of the JSOC uh, commander uh, who was fighting already in Afghanistan. But it was Admiral Willie Moore who could picture that we could put the enemy on the horns of a dilemma. They're fighting up north. If we hit in the south, right away you split them. And pretty soon, we just created a whole lot of dilemmas for the enemy, and they weren't able to deal with it. Jim, what was most <clears> indelible <throat> about that meeting for me was seeing how pumped up the troops were going through the assault training in the desert. But then at night, they would gather in your tent, your operations tent. Right. And you'd have these book readings sessions. Mm -hmm. And T.E. Lawrence, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, uh, the Battle of Algiers. I remember they had that videotape, mm -hmm. and whatever. Yeah. Did you know at that time that these tribal and geopolitical conflicts were really going to shape your destiny and your legacy for almost the next two decades? Well, what, what had happened, Mike, uh, in 1979, I first sailed into those waters as an infantry company commander on Navy amphibs. <clears throat> and to go back in time, 1979, you'll remember, is when Khomeini comes to power in Tehran. The Soviets move into Afghanistan. The Grand Mosque is hit. Uh, we have oil price spikes, <clears throat> all those kind of things going on. And so I'd actually concentrated on the area since 1979 or been training for it uh, since, since those days. Uh, and uh, you just sense that even today, ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with the aftershocks of 1979. We continue to deal with them today. There's been new aftershocks, but you can go back to a lot of those days and see what happened. So I had no doubt we would continue to have problems in the region. Then in 1979, your first possible confrontation <clears throat> with the Iranians, you were on a, a battalion landing team that was supposed to t attack a refinery or some operation as a diversion mm -hmm. so they could get the hostages out. Uh, so you feel like you've had been up close and personal with the Iranians since 1979? Uh, well, we'd certainly, I'd certainly clearly watched them since those days. It was obviously a revolutionary regime. It's not a nation state in the sense of the leadership cares about their people. Our problem with Iran has never been the Iranian people, and we should never be confused about this. They're held hostage by these thugs that are in power, and they are a revolutionary regime, and if they ever surrender being revolutionary, they'll lose their moral uh, of their moral standing to be the people in charge of a country that's penalized every day because of their inept leadership. But I think the most important leadership point there, Mike, would be that you're responsible as you grow in any leadership organization for your own development. 
and you need to be watching the world because when you go into a leadership position, you're really moving into a sentinel position. You don't want your corporation caught flat-footed by a new technology that makes yours obsolete. You don't want your military caught flat-footed, uh, basically uh, dominant in some field of expertise in war fighting that's irrelevant, that no longer matters because the enemy's found a new way to fight. With the Middle East, it was very clear that we were going to be fighting against an ideology more than anything else and that terrorism was going to be the manifestation. 1984, Secretary Schultz, I was just in New York City on 9-11 uh, this last week. In 1984, you gave a speech in New York City that said we are going to have to preempt terrorist attacks, we are going to lose some of our troops, we're going to lose innocent people to this, it's coming. Uh, many did not look at it that way. Uh, seven years later, I was fighting in a mechanized task force, not against terrorists, but that was 17 years, sir, before 9-11, and you stood right in New York and warned us it was coming, and some of us didn't see as clearly as you. That's the bottom line. That, that's an example of leadership. General. <laughs> Your first taste of combat came during the Gulf War, 1991, under George W. Bush. Um, some important lessons learned there about building allies, and having a plan, and having the equipment to complete the mission. Uh, was that fairly indelible in your mind as to uh, a fairly successful operation, a well thought out operation? Well, it was strategically one of the soundest operations I think you could study <clears throat> uh, of any period because President Bush said it will not stand that Kuwait was taken over by Saddam. He then worked the phones. I think by the time he was done, there was all of about four countries in the world that weren't helping us in some way or voting with us in the United Nations. And we went in on the operation, <clears throat> and we were fully manned. Uh, we lacked for nothing. When the military said we needed this many hundred thousand troops to have it over, and I think we said initially three months or four months, he added more troops, said, I want it over fast. There was no artificial restraints put on us. And then when we, when we routed the enemy, uh, and we did so very, very quickly, there were a lot of people saying, march on Baghdad, keep on going. And he said, no, that will break the coalition apart. We don't want to do that. They all joined up with us to free the people of Kuwait. We did that. And by the way, strategically, Iraq is a block to Iran's, the, these nutcases I was talking about, who 10 years before had taken over the country of Iran. So you saw a strategically sound and very mature plan, fully resourced. The commander in chief was the commander in chief. He did not get into the tactics, but he made very clear the mission and then refused to have mission creep, no growth to it. So you were able to go in, accomplish it. And one of the most important lessons I took from that is the leader has to set the vision. It has to be achievable. Uh, it has to be something that he writes out and says, this is what we're going to do. It doesn't have to be long. I mean, it's pretty good when he says, this will not stand. Everyone knew what he was standing for at that point. But you've got to get that part clear. Because if you don't start out with that part clear, I don't care how brilliant your generals are or how brave your sergeants are, things are going to go wrong. Because you, just, you can't carry out a bad strategy well and think that somehow that's going to end in, a, in an op, you know, basically an opportune way for the country. It's going to end, but it may not be the way you intended. General, on a personal level, being part of uh, Task Force Ripper, 1st Marine Division, commanded by General Myatt, you said in the book that you made a lot of mistakes, or you made mistakes in your career, mm -hmm. but you always seem to be promoted after those mistakes. Yeah. You later said, in fact, it was always subordinate initiative that got my lads out of the jams I got them into, my mistakes being my own. You talked about an incident going by a gravel pit that you had mm -hmm. overlooked yeah. and got, got some men in some very difficult situation. Well, it was. And, and General Mayan, did, did I ever thank you for those two minefields you sent me into? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, what had happened, and, and, and this is a reminder why I always used to insi would insist ever after that commanders had to sleep. They had to stay rested. 
because about the third or fourth day, I forget what it was, we were quite tired and we're coming around a gravel, a big quarried area. We sent helicopters over, they said nothing's in there. We went around it and we were just spreading back out into the battle formation when the whole horizon lit up as we drove under some power lines. Perfect target reference point. It should have alerted me as, as we were coming up on it. Now I've got 1,200 guys under fire from the front and wouldn't you know right then, bypassed mechanized units come out behind to hit my logistics troops, my Navy corpsmen, supply guys, refueler trucks, this sort of thing. And so you know right away that you're not von Klauswitz or Rommel when your mortar guys are getting out of their vehicles, setting up four mortars pointing north and four pointing south. <laughs> In the middle of the open desert, you managed to get your battalion surrounded. Um, without going into a lot of detail, the, the lads took care of it. Uh, we got through it. Uh, later that day, uh, we were halted for a little bit to rearm and refuel. And the regimental commander, Colonel Fulford, called us over and said, we got word they're murdering innocent people. The Iraqi army is in the streets of Kuwait City. We're going to break through tonight. And it's very dark and this sort of thing because of the oil clouds. And so uh, he said, get back to your for you. This will be the formation. We're going right now. And so I turned to walk away. We all were moving back to our vehicles, get back to our units. And the colonel called to me and said, Jim, come over here. And I said, yep. And he said, you learned something today? I said, yes, sir. And he said, good. And he turned around and walked off. Didn't make a big deal of it, but it was reflective of every, t every rank. Uh, I remember a young army major, very enterprising young guy, came over to where Secretary Schultz and I work at Stanford after I got out of the Marines. And he was studying my career. And he said, are you aware that you got either a letter of reprimand or admonition or, or administrative caution at every single rank but one? <laughs> and I said, how'd I miss one? <laughs> but the good thing was that the Marine Corps recognizes that they need initiative and aggressiveness. And if the mistakes are true mistakes, and there's a world of difference between a mistake and a lack of discipline. They recognize that those mistakes are bridges to learning how you should do things, that you actually learn something from it. And they did promote me every time I made a mistake. And I made a lot of mistakes, but it taught me the role of a coach and how you just keep coaching your troops. Just keep coaching them and make sure you're making it clear what you want done. If they're making a lot of mistakes, you might want to look at the coach in the mirror that night and say, you got to shape up. you got to do a little better, you know? Jim, you also talk a lot about not letting doctrine and dogma get in the way of coming mm -hmm. up with strategies and executing missions and being enterprising. And uh, Afghanistan probably has to be the poster for that. Here, you, no one thought the Marines would go into Afghanistan too far away, 400 miles inland. Uh, you're an amphibious force. Uh, all my colleagues uh, in the press, we were all hanging out at Fort Benning and Fort Bragg trying to get a ride with the Airborne, thinking it was going to be an Airborne show. But you, and I think just a skeleton staff of about two or three, came up with that strategy, thinking out of the box about how you might be able to affect change. You know, it wasn't that hard. Uh, you know, the admiral, I had a fighting admiral. He had a vision of what he needed done. Uh, he was willing to put me in command of his ships. First time that's happened since I think 1812 when a Marine uh, happened to command a, a ship we'd captured. Um, and the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, back in the 1950s, some Marines had bought, bought KC-130s, air refueling C-130s that could refuel helicopters in the air. The Marines in the 1970s bought helicopters with big refueling probes. Uh, in the 1970s, we bought light, uh, light armored vehicles, wheeled vehicles, very mobile, but not too heavy. Uh, in the 1990s, we changed our recruit training to make it much more physically rigorous uh, and, and tougher on the troops. And so all I did was sit in my, there and think, I've got these airplanes that can tank up the helicopters. I've got Marines who are aggressive, and I can take these light armored vehicles in. I'm going to have naval air support. I mean, it doesn't take a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, I got three years of college, OK? That's it, OK? <laughs> uh, you can see it. But uh, the bottom line is, thanks to what they had uh, and the way that we were brought up in after action reports was if after an exercise, you started trying to justify something you'd done wrong with, with doctrine. Doctrine's a good starting point, but it's not a straitjacket. And under that very uh, crisp, 
marine, short haircuts, sharp uniforms and all. Uh, underneath that are some of the most maverick thinkers I've ever seen anywhere. And if you try to defend uh, bad conduct by saying, well, that's the doctrine, you'd be laughed out of the officer's club. I mean, that's, it's, it's not, we like disciplined thinking, we don't like regimented thinking. So as soon as I explained this to the, the colonels as they checked in, the MU commanders, they knew exactly what they could do. We, we could have gone more than 350 nautical models, we could have gone 600. I was talking to my Russian liaison officer when I was at Norfolk. I said, hey, I could have gone to Moscow. He didn't like that. <laughs> but, but, you know, my point is that there's a long reach of the naval forces. The Navy can put their influence a long ways ashore. You know, for those who served in a different era, we never had that cooperation, that inter-service cooperation, which you guys have fine-tuned mm -hmm. since 9-11. The cooperation level, you working with a Navy SEAL commander, uh, an admiral, and putting all these pieces together and working as a joint team, mm. good theory, you know, synergy, good idea, but it, I don't think it's always been the case in the military, but now it is. You guys really work more closely together than I've ever seen. Well, we, we do work closely together, but if you look at Ulysses Grant and Farragut or Porter in the Mississippi campaign in the Civil War, they work very well together. In my case, here I have an admiral who asks me if I can do it, I say yes. I walk out and I see one of my old SEAL buddies out there, so what are you doing here? He said, well, I got my SEAL teams here in Bahrain, but I don't have any helicopters, so I can't get into the war. I smiled and shook his hand and said, you're going to war. That's all I'm going to <laughs> Next, uh, I flew in to uh, Islamabad, and there the ambassador looked up at 8 o'clock in the morning when I walked into her office, said, who are you and what in the hell are you doing in my country? Uh, and I said, well, I had a real neat little brief and everything. I dropped it on her couch and that wasn't going to work, obviously. And I said, well, I'm Jim Mattis. I'm going to take about a thousand of my best friends up to Afghanistan and kill some people. And she said, <laughs> Just really, what the ambassador Donald. wanted to hear. I mean, yeah. any ambassador, that would make uh, an ambassador's day. And uh, the ambassador looked at me and said, well, General, sit down. I think I can help you. And she opened <laughs> all the doors to the Pakistani general staff. Uh, the Pakistanis, when we got over some initial uh, disagreements, uh, knew H hour, D day, and the objective two weeks in advance, never revealed it. Uh, JSOC gave me the target that they thought best and was one we had already chosen, so it was a, coll a collision of SOCOM, Special Operations Command, and the Marines. And on my way back, I stopped by to see the, uh, the Air Force commander, never worked with him before, Lieutenant General. And I went in, uh, he and I in his room uh, there in Prince Sultan Air Base, and I slid the map over, and I had a neat little arrow drawn from the ships into where we were going to assault into. And he looked at it, and he put his fingers on the statute miles and, and marched them in from the ships. He slid the map back across to me, and he said, you're going to do this? I said, yes, sir. And he said, then I'm going to move your two Marine liaison officers out of the KOC, the Operation Center floor, and put them up here with the one star who watches it. He said, if you get in trouble, I'll put every airplane in the air over your head. And based on trusting his word right then to show how deep this, co this uh, collaboration goes, the trust goes, first time in my Marine Corps career I didn't take artillery in in the assault waves, which allowed me to bring more assault troops, more vehicles to be mobile. And sure enough, the enemy moved against us on D plus one, and the airplanes were overhead, and the Navy made short work of them. So that's just how it worked. Diplomat, SEAL, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Jet, uh, Army Special Forces all came together, and that's what your country can do, because we work together. And right now, coming back and looking at our country right now, I think there may be a model there for the rest of the country to look at, not to be militaristic, but let's start collaborating with one another. Nothing can, can stop us if we do that. You say uh, speed and disruption is key. Mm -hmm. After you had taken Kandahar and started this new advance on the Taliban, um, you thought you could go up to Tora Bora and try to block the exit of mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm based on something you read in history. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, we were in Kandahar. It had fallen without a fight. Uh, we were up against guys who have no chess. I mean, they're good at slapping women around for not wearing a veil. But frankly, I expected a much tougher fight uh, than, than what we had. 
Uh, so we're there, and the intelligence community says, we think we know, and we had very good reason based on what they, the source of the information, that Osama bin Laden was in one of two valleys. And here's where I made a mistake, because I immediately, by this point, I had troops alongside us who were from Canada, the United Kingdom, Norway, Germany, uh, Jordan, uh, Turkey, New Zealand, Australia. And they weren't under our command, but we were all working very well together. And so immediately I said, okay, get the plans ready. And the Geronimo campaign back in the 1880s, the U.S. Army had put heliograph stations with mirror stations along our border to stop the Indians or to spot them so the cavalry knew where to move on them because it was a very, very difficult time for the ranchers and the people down there. And so we did a visibility diagram now using computers, and we knew exactly which high ground to sit on along the border that would block those big valleys and, and, and block so they couldn't get out. And then we would move assault troops up, and we would basically push them into the outposts, and we'd, we'd get them. Uh, what happened was I was so focused down, I forgot that I was now answering to the Army in Doha for my ashore forces and I still commanded the ships out at sea under the Navy, but I did not spend the time basically uh, accommodating more uh, relationship with my Army commander, and I didn't tell him what we had in mind. And when it finally came up, it, uh, the other people thought it was better to have locals do it. We knew the locals couldn't do it. They were fighting alongside us. We knew them well by this point, but bottom line is uh, we were not allowed to do it and uh, Osama bin Laden got away. Eventually, as you know, the SEALs got him, but it was a long, good many years later, and I think we missed an opportunity, and I consider myself at least as responsible for that failure as those who held me back, because I did not spend the time. I was all looking down, and when you're a leader, you've also got to be looking up and, and bringing the problem statement up and getting an agreement on it, I can solve that. And if you don't do that, you can't just assume that somehow they're all maturing with you and they've got five different teams out there from northern Afghanistan and to western Afghanistan all fighting. So we just had a little better situational awareness and I, I probably should have done a lot better. I, I absolutely should have done a lot better on saying we had this opportunity. Safe for catching Osama bin Laden, December 2001. Had the mission generally been accomplished in Afghanistan if it was initially to disrupt the al-Qaeda training, support, and Taliban, and now here we are 18 years later and it's still going on? I mean, yeah. what, do you, what do you think on that? Here's, uh, I'd like to bring a more positive picture of this, but terrorism is going to be an ambient threat. It's going to be around for all of our lifetimes in this room, including the very young people uh, who are here. It's good to see you here, but we're going to have to deal with this. Uh, you can want a war over, uh, you can declare the war over, but as they say, it taught us all in the military, the enemy gets a vote. If the enemy says the war isn't over, you're going to have to continue to deal with it. Now, how we deal with it should be by, with, and through allies. I'll give you a great example. Right now, as we sit here tonight, in the Lake Sahal region, the uh, Lake Chad region uh, of Africa, the African nations that are fighting Boko Haram are doing so under the French leadership and support that the French are giving, and we give support to the French-led effort there. We have probably, I don't know, a couple thousand, two, three thousand folks out there. The French have probably 10,000 of their elite troops, their foreign legion, paratroopers, marines, out there working with the African nations and trying to get them to take on this enemy. And we're going to have to do that. I think we're, we can never just say we're just going to leave it all to someone else. There's something about an American soldier uh, alongside others. There doesn't have to be a lot of them, but they'll stiffen their spines. They'll, they'll bring out the manhood in those guys, and they will go after the enemy. So we should do this more by, with, and through our allies, never humiliating them. Uh, they're not all as good as us. I realize that but I got over enjoying public humiliation by second grade. You know, it's, it, it's not a good way to build things. So you do things by with, uh, as Condoleezza Rice said, Ambassador Rice put it, we do things with our allies, not to them. And you see the French-led effort has been through three administrations in Paris. They've sustained it. 
So they've earned our support, and certainly African nations have earned it as they fight this enemy. So you don't have to do it all on the backs of the American taxpayer, the backs of the American troops, but we're going to have to fight this. We don't need to go through another learning experience uh, that was like 9-11. You seemed somewhat surprised then and afterwards about going into Iraq in 2003. Hmm. You say in the book, the argument for invading and deposing Saddam was based on preempting any future transfer of weapons of mass destruction to terrorists. Even assuming he had chemical weapons, I believe we had them boxed in with our daily combat air patrols and sanctions against his oil exports. Having served 20 years in the region, I knew that his hatred of Iran worked in our strategic advantage. Did you have some major reservations hearing that initial strategy of going into Iraq? Well, we've been, I've been fighting in Afghanistan, and as all of the veterans in the room know, when you're actually in the fight, you're actually rather myopic. You're, you're just focused on your mission that day. <clears throat> but I'd spent a lot of time in the Middle East, sailing there, studying there, serving there, fighting there. And I knew the, the hatreds, the, the historic hatreds between the Ba'ath Party in Baghdad and the Iranians. Uh, it, it, it was palpable. I mean, it was, it was impacting all the time. There'd been a murderous war, years of war, between Iraq and Iran. Uh, and I knew our Air Force was overhead every day in Northern and Southern Watch, operations Northern and Southern Watch. So yeah, I, I was really surprised by it. Uh, but I think, too, uh, keeping faith with the Constitution, keeping faith with civilian control of the military, I, I believe that there were officers above me who would bring the reasons uh, to perhaps not do it into the, into the discussions. So when I was brought back, I was told I was to go down and get 1st Marine Division ready to go. Uh, and so that's what I did, knowing that up above me there were military officers giving the military uh, input that would allow what I would assume would be a, a good decision. And so I. You know, you cannot make a moral argument for Saddam Hussein being kept in power. You may be able to make a strategic argument about it, but I would just tell you that my job went from fighting in Afghanistan to getting 23,000 sailors and Marines ready to go in 1st Marine Division. So I just kind of minded my own cabbage patch at that point. Well, you had taken on Saddam before, so you knew what his forces were like. Yeah. And you weren't that intimidated by it. You didn't think... Uh, it was going to be that difficult from a military standpoint. But your reading of the area, mm -hmm. was there something lingering in the back of your mind that invading Mesopotamia is one thing, occupying is another thing? Well, if you go back and read about Xenophon <clears throat> and the Anabasis, he says there's a line in there. It, it's something like this. When he's talking to his, it's the March of the 10,000. He says, if we don't immediately take control of the surrounding country, sorry, or the, of, the, of the population, the surrounding countryside will rise up against us. So I read about what happened to the British in World War I when they lost an entire division in the exact ground that I would be attacking through. So you're forewarned at that point about what can go wrong. Fortunately, uh, I had a lieutenant general over me uh, when I got back who commanded the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, the California Force. And in the war game, and all you do in a war game is you practice basically fighting and writing plans for the next day. That's what a war game does, and it checks. Can you do this fluidly? Can you keep things going? And our general, in front of all these old generals who retired down to come in and they grade you, and they're very, they're very brutal in their grading, by the way, in private, um, they, uh, he pulls out all the planners and said, you're going to plan for what happens after the fighting. And his not so bright deputy, Brigadier General Mattis, said, well, General, can't we first plan on how we're going to win the war. He said, no, no, this will be the war, what happens afterwards. So we had uh, seasoned officers who recognized the danger that we would be getting into, Mike, and we did make plans for that. They were not sufficient. There's, there's a legitimate reason to say that on a strategic basis, we didn't have a plan. But on the tactical basis, you never have, you're not a victim. You, 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 as a leader, you take decisions and you make things happen. So you don't get cynical. You don't act like a victim. Well, there's nothing we can do about it. Yes, there is. You can do it right. You can do it well and make sure you're planning for what you see coming if you've studied history. My general had studied more history than I had, obviously. And that plan <laughs> was predicated on speed, 
maneuverability, some feints. You, wanted, you felt you had to move very quickly, cover yes. the ground, rather than get confronted by, bogged down by Iraqi divisions. Uh, uh, my videographer, Mike Elwell, was here tonight with us. We were sitting there on a briefing you made, and you made the comment. He said, well, we're 1st Marine Division. We're California-based. We drive fast on the highways. We're going to go fast. Mm. And, and, and Good training ground. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then the idea about being flexible in your planning. Um, Colonel Dunford, the regimental commander, who's now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was very candid with me once we were embargoed and we couldn't report any information. And he told me, the invasion's going to be on the 21st. Get your batteries ready. Get your people ready. This is it. And then on the 19th and 20th, some rockets started flying. And uh, we were asked to put up, we were told to put on our chemical suits. Mm -hmm. Things got really tense at that point. Um, I'm sure it was very tense for you having to decide whether to go in early, keep to your original plan, or modify it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, things always happen. Uh, we used to say all the advantage to planning is the planning. It's not the plan. As soon as you have contact with the enemy, things change. Uh, so when we got the word that they were maneuvering troops down, off, possibly to blow off the oil wells again, like they had done before, when they occupied Kuwait, we decided to switch everything around and we sent 5th Marines in uh, on very short notice uh, to lead the attack where they were supposed to be the second assault regiment going in. And it just shows that you've got to have young people who can adapt very, very quickly uh, on the fly. And it's also why you have to have been very, very clear when you give the commander's intent. It should go out in one form to your commanders and, and, and for a couple layers below. But something's got to go to your individual troops, too, because they have to have some form of guidance that they sense removes all the, chain, all the levels between them and a general. And they sense that you're all on the same sheet of music. <clears throat> I find some of the best words for this in antiquity. Um, I stole from the physician's oath, first do no harm. Uh, then I, from an old dead Roman general, I got no better friend, no worse enemy. In other words, discriminate. Be the best friend in the world to these poor people. We're going in to free them. No triumphalism. Uh, we're, you're, and then if you've got to take someone out, you take them out. So you make it very clear what you're going to do tactically, but you have to reach both the heads and the hearts of the young sailors and Marines so that they know what's going on and sense that they're part of something bigger because they're going to put their lives on the line. Uh, no better friend, no worse enemy. I think everyone's familiar with the expression. It's quite famous now. What struck me was the context in which it was delivered on the night of March 19th. Uh, this letter was handed out to every Marine in every vehicle, in every foxhole. Oh, yeah. I got this from uh, Lieutenant Beenick, who's here tonight, who was our executive officer. He saved the copy. You're known for your aggressiveness, and you're also known for trying to aggressively maintain the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. These kids, these men and women, full chemical suits, not sure what was going to happen the next morning. They get this note, and it says, our fight is not with the Iraqi people. Be the hunter, not the hunted. You're part of the world's most trusted and feared force. Keep our honor clean. Engage your brain before your weapon. Powerful lines at a powerful time. I mean, you're known for your famous <clears throat> quotes and very outspoken. But I don't think people always understand those famous quotes, the context which they mm -hmm. came from. And this, I know, is indelible in the, in the ears and minds of everyone who got it that day. Well, we owe that to, to when you're in a leadership position, you're there because you can't do the job yourself. That's why you're given, you're, you're called the boss or the CEO or the commanding general. And so you, what you need to understand is you're not a leader until your subordinates tell you you're a leader. You're, just, you're the boss, you're the commanding general, but the leader, that, that title is given you by your subordinates. And in this case, we knew we were going into a populated country that had been under a despot so this battlefield was also a humanitarian field, and everyone had to understand that. And if they didn't understand it, they were going to have a very hard time looking in the mirror the rest of their life when they came home from that operation 
if they did something they shouldn't, uh, that they just couldn't live with. I mean, tragedies happen in war. War is one big tragedy mounted on another tragedy. That's all it is. But you've got to do your best to give them the, the awareness to pass on. This is why they keep some gray-haired sergeants and, and colonels around, because not your first war, your second war, your third war. And you can help guide them through what is going to be, it's just going to be an experience that strips the veneer of civilization right off them. And somehow you've got to hold the center inside each one of your sailors and Marines. Eventually, as I went up, I soldiers, airmen, coast guardsmen, and allied troops. Because if you don't do that, then you're not carrying out your real role as a leader that they have now made you, you know. And that's why I used to turn over a lot of decisions to lower ranking people. I trusted them. And as Secretary Schultz taught us, uh, trust is the coin of the realm when you're a leader. And I think people would be surprised to learn, especially as Vietnam veterans, that all those young junior NCOs, all this, all ranks, <coughs> walked a huge sand table replica of what the opening gambit strategy was going to be. So every man in the unit knew where the Ramala oil fields were, where the Basra airfield was. In Vietnam, we weren't really given that kind of clarity about the big picture of the big mission, which is go out and do the mission. And it seems like this generation of warfighters really rises to that. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they want to take charge. And you guys gave them the reins to take charge. Well, we did, but it is built on, on Vietnam. It's built on Korea, World War II, all the way back to the revolution. <clears throat> because <clears throat> the good thing is that when you teach history to young troops and they do soak it up, they get tested on it, believe it or not, in, the, in boot camp. And what really happens is they start to understand they'll not be asked to do anything harder than bloody Shiloh, or live any rougher than Valley Forge. And so there almost becomes a sense of, of I can't let down the veterans who were there before. I'll give you an example. We're getting ready to assault a city called Fallujah. I won't go into why the orders were what they were and all, but I've got two assault battalions to send in, so I go down to see them. It's about midnight, time for generals to get out of the way and turn it over to the infantry the infant soldier, the young soldiers. That's how they got their name. So as I'm falling back, my half dozen radio operators about a mile away to my vehicles, I'm walking behind an assault unit that will go in actually just before dawn to clear out the enemy between the outskirt, the city itself and the outskirts of the assault battalion could move into the city and begin to take it down, take the enemy down. And we were moving behind them and uh, the enemy made some, some mischief there. And so I got down and checked in with the corporal, uh, with the Marines who were laying there along the ground, ready to go in. They were stripped down to their fighting gear, very chilly night. And he said, no problem, he'd take care of the problem there with the enemy, and they did. And the enemy fell back again. We were just probing during the night before we attacked in. And the, uh, so I just lay there for a few minutes, make sure it was all quiet before I got my guys up and created more movement and all. And I heard one of the young Marines say to the corporal, uh, do you think Fallujah is going to be real rough? And because uh, we have ladies here, I won't put it in quite the corporal's response. <clears throat> but he basically said, hush and get some sleep. We took Iwo Jima, Fallujah won't be nothing. Now, he was not alive, to say the least, when Iwo Jima was taken. But in his mind, the veterans who'd gone before had set the standard. And no words, even the words I put in that letter that you just noted there, Mike, no words are as effective as the raw example of the veterans who've been there before. And that's what really gives our lads the spirit to close with the enemy. Everybody talks about command and control. Yeah. You switch that around a little bit. You say command and feedback. You, want, yeah. you have the intent, you give everybody the big plan, the big strategy, and then you listen. Well, uh, you have to be listening all the time. Uh, listening, learning, helping, and leading. <clears throat> but the thing is, if you want to do C2, command and control, I change it into clarify and confirm. Go around to sand tables, go around and have small groups, like for a general, that's like 800 guys around you. 
um, you know, go from one battalion to another and say, here's what you're going to do, and I'm not leaving until you ask me questions. <clears throat> Close the gap between you and the lads and make sure that you're clarifying and confirming they know what you want. Use vignettes, you know, what do you do if, this sort of thing. And then you have command and feedback. That's not my dream. You know, that's not something I dreamed up. That's the way the Marine Corps runs today under maneuver warfare. We don't use command and control those words except when we're in a joint environment so that we can dovetail in with the other services. But we use command and feedback. And there's any number of ways to get it, out wandering around, try to go up front. That'll, you'll always learn more there. Another way, just to have three questions in every one of your sailors and Marine minds. What do I know? Who needs to know? Have I told them? And if they just keep thinking like that and pumping the information back, you can free them to use their initiative and aggressiveness. And they'll, they'll do a good job if you give them the chance. So it was a great success, 400 miles in 17 days. You took Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Casualties were relatively low on both sides, given you were going into very populated areas. Mm -hmm. And that was because I assumed the speed at which it was accomplished. Then it, the wheels fell off. Because mm -hmm. of not having the right plan afterwards, do you feel that was the critical mistake? Well, we had an American military deep inside the heart of the Middle East where they'd been raised on hatred of America. Removing, if you, if you study what happened in Yugoslavia when Tito came out, and you see where all the ethnic hatreds came out, and we all dealt with the Balkans. You remember the front page news of the horrible uh, headlines coming out of there after the Cold War. Uh, you could expect there'd be violence. Uh, we, what we tried to do uh, at, in our area, for example, where we were assigned to take over there in the southern area, uh, we lost two Marines killed and about 50 wounded, and most of that was from what I would call criminal activity, really. So what we were trying to do in that area, <clears throat> I told them, I told the, the troops, I said, okay, it's changed now. And it's more important you get the water purification system going and you stop cholera. It's more important you get the electricity going again. But we didn't have those skill sets in our infantry units. You know, it were, were, we were assault troops. So we had a, a probably a less than perfect, less than adequate, less than sufficient plan to bring in those kinds of experts. Uh, and what we tried to do day by day, ladies and gentlemen, was say, uh, we want to hang on to the peace for one more year, one more month, one more week, one more day, one more hour. I'll give you an example. I go down to the holy city of Najaf one day where my old infantry at the time from the Gulf War was stationed, and I pull in, and here's a line of Marines across the street. They've got bayonets on their rifles. There's people throwing things and yelling at them, and you can just see this is going to go wrong. And the division chaplain was down there. He would rotate around all the time. Great chaplain, uh, Father Divine, was there. And he grabbed water, cold water in bottles in, that was on ice. And he went out through the Marine lines. And he and a couple of other Marines and sailors passed out ice cold water to all these demonstrators. It's really hard to throw a rock at somebody when it's 125 degrees and it's very humid and just handed you a bottle of cold water out there. And the Marine Battalion commander was trying to work with people. He got them over, said, what's the problem? They said, we've got no air conditioning. There's no electric power. He said, yeah, we don't have it here. Come on in, pick a couple people. Let's talk about what we're going to do. Died down, and we bought the piece one more day you know, to try and fix it. But eventually, the patience wore out. Uh, the disbanding of the Iraqi army, that we just disbanded the people who were trained to fight. Uh, we were getting them back into their barracks at that time and paying them stipends to feed their families and starting to hold officer schools where we'd talk to them, what was it like when you fought the Iranians? What was it like when you fought us in Desert Storm? You know, try, getting over the humiliation. We'd just beaten them and they weren't allowed, they, they, they didn't fight very much or anything. And then we got told to disband them. And so all of these things, the legacy issues, the current lack of services, and now a disbanded, disgruntled army, and, you know, it's like you've mixed gunpowder and a drunk with a cigarette, you know? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's probably going to blow up on you. 
this, this strategic disconnect between administrations, politicians, and the military pronounced in Iraq with not having a complete plan, a pullout that caused more problems throughout the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You say it's not really a matter of political or personal disagreements or philosophical disagreements. It's really the nature of the two entities. Yeah. Politicians have to be promising things and aspirational. Military guys like you deal with the reality of the situation. Is that where you think these basic conflict happens between the military and administrations in situations like this? Well, I've been taught that when we run for office in this country, you divide. You know, you say, I'm smart, this guy is not so smart, vote for me. Or I'm right, she's wrong, vote for me. And that's division, I understand that. And then these politicians come into office and, they, and we all want what they want. They're, they're not alien, they're not from some other planet. We want health care, we want education, we want infrastructure. Uh, we want these things, and then there's this bad world out there that the intelligence people and the military deal with. So there's probably a natural tension between war's grim realities on this hand and natural, I hope, natural human uh, uh, aspirations on the other, and they don't, they don't meet and, jo and fall together unless it's a really, really good leader. I mean, you see some people are able to do it. As FDR walks our country into preparations for World War II, you see a man in the midst of a depression who's actually able to do this. And yet, if you go to England today and read their history books, it's how we stayed on the sidelines as Europe fell to fascism because we weren't ready to go. Even FDR, as great a leader as he was, could not make that jump and bring the American people with him until something bad happened. Pearl Harbor. So you have to recognize this is not personal, but you do have to try to be persuasive. And at times, the best way to do that, again, is history. Because if you bring in an, an analogous situation, it removes the personality from you against, kind of against each other in that room and say, this is what happened. You know, and you go back to, uh, you know, to Ulysses Grant's administration, or you go back to what Wilson faced in World War I. Uh, the reason I bring it up is when Churchill was, I just read a great book, by the way, uh, called Appeasement, but when Churchill was asked midway through World War II, what were we going to call World War II? Remember, we, we called it the Great War, was World War I, and, we, and World War II was just the war they were fighting, right? The, you know, well, what are you gonna call it? And without a moment's hesitation, he said, the unnecessary war. Now think about that, 60, 70 million dead, and it was unnecessary? Everything that grew out of that? And he said, if the, if the democracies had united and confronted that reality of fascism in the 30s, they would never have gotten the, the strength that eventually cost the world what it did. And so what you sometimes feel like you're doing is you're trying to keep this experiment we call America alive from external enemies by, by weighting yourself on a conservative, let's prevent that war, let's try to avoid that mistake. For example, the pullout from Iraq. The intelligence community made very clear if we pulled all of our troops out, it'd be like you're teaching your daughter how to ride a bicycle and she's got four wheels on the ground, then you move the training wheels up one inch, then you move them up two inches and she totters a little bit, she's doing it. And pretty soon you can take those wheels off. Well, what we did, we went from four wheels on the ground to yanking them off. And the intel community said, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have to go back in. And when they were exactly right, and anyone who says that ISIS was an intelligence failure, no, it was not. They told us exactly what would happen, and that's what we had to deal with when millions were, millions were made refugees by ISIS, uh, tens of thousands killed. That's what happens when you have that disconnect. General, you were Secretary of Defense for 712 days. You said you did as best you could, as long as you could. Mm -hmm. You were also famously asked, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you up at night now? Well, you know, first of all, you know, I, I took no part in the election, Mike, as you know. I don't believe generals, retired generals should. Uh, but if asked to serve, I was raised by the greatest generation. It's a privilege and it's a duty. Republican or Democrat, if you think you're ready, you go in and you serve. You do the best you can. 
Uh, while there, nothing did keep me up at night, although the phone rang an awful lot at night. Um, you know, we'll, we'll forget that. That was just minor stuff, uh, part of the duty. Uh, but now there is one thing that worries me more than ever, and that is this willingness to look at people we disagree with politically during elections and all and say they're completely wrong. Uh, they could not be right. Uh, our willingness to listen to only one television news station or one, one news station. This idea that somehow uh, we don't have to unify to keep this experiment called America alive because we all live here by, by choice. We're, most of us were born here by choice or moved here by choice. We have a responsibility to turn this country over to our successors with the pluribus unum, meaning something more than a, some Latin words on a coin in our pocket. And right now, I'm, I'm very concerned. You know, Abraham Lincoln at the Young Men's Lyceum, isn't that an interesting word, uh, 1858, says that, uh, and he knows the country's being torn apart, and he said, you know, this, this country could face all the combined armies of Africa and Europe and Asia, and even if they had a Bonaparte, remember Napoleon had died a few decades before this, before our Civil War. This is 1858, before the Civil War. He said they could combine and come here, even with a great military leader, and they will not cross the Blue Ridge Mountains. They will not get a drink of water out of the Ohio River because free, free people won't let them get that far. We'll stop them. He said, no, if this is to die, what we have here, it'll die by suicide. And that, when I read those words here recently, and I'm watching what's passing for political dialogue, discourse uh, these days, it, that, that was enough to keep me awake that night. Is there any way? Last question. Last question. <laughs> Outside of serving in a political office, is there any way any one individual like yourself could possibly change this conversation, change no. this dynamic? No, this is not, there's not one person driving this hatred in the country that's loose or this contempt for one another, and there's no one person that's gonna change it. Uh, th it is time that we all roll up our sleeves in our parishes, in our school districts, in our communities, in our colleges, in our high schools, in these kind of gatherings here, and we all roll up our sleeves and when someone starts bandying this enemy of the state or you're a terrorist because you think differently than someone else, uh, it's time we stand up for someone. Especially it's important that we stand up for them and don't allow them to be called that when we disagree with them. In other words, we don't just want to stand up for the ones we agree with. If we see someone being called a terrorist because they have a different point of view and they're a fellow American, let's keep our affection for one another and protect them and say, I disagree 100% with you, and I, I don't agree with you being called a terrorist, and by the way, I'm going to dinner with you tonight. You know, you, we got to get over this stuff, what we're doing. Anyway, there we go. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.